Speaking of public dumb Maine, <laughs> this. <laughs> what a this, transition. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> AEW on Wednesday night, July the 19th, broadcast, although they were narrow casting to the lowest common denominator, they broadcast their blood and guts television special. And I'm going to give credit at the top of the program to your friend and mine and the friend of all serious wrestling fans, Brian Solomon. Did you see his tweet after the main event had concluded? I think so. I don't remember it verbatim, though. I have it right here. Jesus, wrote, you certainly I, do. I wrote it down. He said, I long for the fabled day when one of the two major companies can put on a war games in which the participants actually know how to work the match without props and it doesn't turn into Gallagher with blood. All they were missing was the watermelon and the sledgehammer. <sighs> That's a great way of putting it. Gallagher with blood. Gallagher with blood is what we've come to. <laughs> it's a... The best wrestling match in the history of goddamn tag team wrestling, practically, was on a fucking the same company's television show last Saturday night, and then they let these brain-warped children go out there and, you know, one team wants to be video game heroes, and not champions of playing video games, but actual heroes in the video games. And the other is captained by a fucking murder porn junkie. What do you think you're going to get? But we didn't get that first. Oh, no. Not first, we didn't. We have finally got a new persona for Jungle Jackoff. Now, who was the... <sighs> What the fuck was going on with him burying a body in the desert and then riding out in a apparently hitchhiked limousine? It wasn't there when he was there. He, it didn't bring him. It pulled up after he was already out in the middle of the desert burying a body that we never saw on his entrance video. And I'll discuss that in a second, and it was stupid, but it would have <laughs> been a little more tolerable if the limo pulls up, the door opens, and there's Anna Jay's legs. Come on in, big boy. Let's go to the arena. Something to justify any of this. But no, it was, I guess, in a very theatrical fashion. They played the Jungle Boy music. They stopped it. He must have said, stop. Play this. I gave them a video of him burying himself, burying oh, Jungle Jesus Boy Christ. in the desert so he can move on to Beethoven's Fifth. Well, I know. I just... I. <sighs> I hear the music and I'm looking at my notepad and petting Harley on the fucking belly. And suddenly I look up and this fucking idiot's in a desert burying an unknown corpse. And I'm like, they're very symbolic there, aren't they? It's almost cruel burying Jungle Boy in the desert. Not the jungle. Not the jungle. The desert. He, he should have been laid to rest in the Amazonian rainforest where cheetah could piss on him and fertilize the area and they could grow a whole new crop of jungle boys tony's got a budget it should have been jack perry in a helicopter throwing jungle boy into the rainforest there you go they could add darby allen shoot it anyway so he comes out now and he's got black leather on and he looks a lot better as a person than the fucking you know, the loincloth, but he's still not very intimidating to to look at because he's not that intimidating, but he looks better. But then as soon as I wrote a note that not very intimidating, did you see he got in the face of a six-year-old boy in the front row and tried to fucking make him flinch and couldn't make the and kid laugh at him? Yeah, he, he actually made the he, move to make him flinch and the kid didn't yes. even break. Yeah, a six-year-old. He wasn't as tall as the rail. <laughs> and the six-year-old was short, short to himself. Anyway, so the it was the FTW title on the line, another belt, this one actually not even officially recognized. We've gone over that a million times. And the confrontation between Hook and Jungle Jack, or well now Jack Perry, and Hook comes out, he acts like he doesn't give a shit, but in a good way. He's got the fucking demeanor, right? You know, it, but at the same point, 
visually, instead of making either one of these guys special, Jungle Boy was special in terms of as a baby face, he could be smaller than the heel, and at least if the heel beat him up, he could sell or whatever. And Hook's a small guy now himself because he's still young and uh, not full grown. But God damn it, it looks such smallness and youngness lookingness. This looked like, what was that, Matt Rats they tried to do with teenage wrestlers in Calgary years ago. But nevertheless, it gets for the younger crowd. So he's trying. He really is trying. Old, old Jack. He's trying to be a heel. I think he's approaching it like he approached being a babyface. He's playing a part rather than he's just a real natural fucking personality, but it's better. They did a ridiculous spot where Hook Northern Lights suplexed Jack off the apron to the floor. <laughs> At least both of them sold. But goddamn, 10 seconds later, Jack was giving Hook a DDT on the floor. And then Hook beat the count. So they got to get that in there. I like Hook's style. I like his throws. I like his judo influence. This wasn't a rotten match as modern matches go with the psychology where you don't really have a fucking leader to ground, ground it and play off of. Um, Hook's got a great German suplex with a bridge. And then... He, it, <laughs> Hook went for another one. Jack grabbed the referee to distract him and mule kicked Hook in the balls, hit him with an elbow, and got a two count. So the balls don't work anymore. I And then... <laughs> the balls don't work anymore. And no, I'm, I don't mean his balls won't work now. I mean that doesn't work to kick somebody in the balls. And then Jack got the title belt and brought it in the ring, and the referee saw it plain as day, and they had a tug of war with it. Oh, Paul Turner, and then suddenly, the referee turned away for no reason and went to yell at someone outside the ring that wasn't there. Just some awkward motion like, oh, I've got to be over here now. And Jack swings the belt, hook ducks, grabs Jack, and they crush the referee in the corner. And now the referee is going to be dead from 275-pounders mashing him in the corner. And Hook suplexes Jack and covers him, but there's no referee. And then they have, I don't know whether they didn't walk through this, or I don't know whether just somebody thought it, but they have Hook go over, and it's like he's checking roadkill. He's just poking and shaking the referee like come around and this he didn't take a fucking chair to the head he was smushed in the corner it might knock the breath out of him his brain's still working he can open his eyes and and see he can see the light he's not been blinded by the light ripped off like a deuce another runner in the night not like that no thank no God. So Hook's trying to wake him up like an idiot, and it doesn't work. So then he turns around, and Jack hits him with the belt. Cover, one, two, three. So they they haven't been beating Hook until they figure out a way to make him look like a moron and then beat him. What'd you think? I think Manford Mann and Bruce Springsteen should both sue. What did you think... I'm all for giving this a chance. Hollywood Jack Perry. Sunglasses, hair pulled back, douchebag, hates the fans, doesn't try to pick on a fan, tries to pick on a kid, and it backfires. <laughs> but the music, what do you think of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony being used? I don't, I don't understand. It doesn't seem like it fits. Well, it's not even, he's not Hollywood Jack Perry with a black leather jacket. He's Magnum, one of Magnum T.A.'s discarded sperm. Magnum with, J.P. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so, you've got a guy who used to be Jungle Boy, who everybody knows is really the son of a Hollywood actor of some repute. And, but then when he switches heel, instead of being Hollywood Jack Perry, He's 
a kind of a biker, surly Jack Perry coming out to entrance music consisting of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. That makes, you know, the Hell's Angels, that's what they used to fucking play whenever they'd ride into town to cause chaos in them black leather jackets. Dun, 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 dun. But, you know, that's the thing. Like, having some kind of grand music for a heel to be booed is one thing. The nature of the piece isn't really... Dun, 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 and then he comes out. Dun, 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 and then it takes a while to build. Dun, 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 and it's all still happening. Go ahead. It's still happening. Like, again, it works for, like, Claudio. You know what I mean? Like, there's certain people it could work for. What about a fifth of Beethoven? Walter Murphy. The disco version? There you go. Memphis? There you I, I'm just telling you. See, Walter Murphy's going to sue now. I think somebody ought to sue over that finish, but besides that, should we move on? Yeah. And did you like Officer Bar Brady catching a secret meeting between Jericho and Don Fallis in the restaurant and the security man having to <laughs> eject him? You know, I don't even know what to pick on first. The ridiculousness of the entire idea or... Actually, I do know what to pick up first. Marvez is acting. Yes. Marvez is unbearable because he's so... Like, even some of the people in wrestling who try to act, you can lose yourself maybe for a second. Him, it's just over the top. I'm a wrestling announcer, and there's crazy things happening. Let's go see what we can find out. Yeah, and, and you know, it's not even... It's, it's phony. It's not over the top. It's... It's, it's in the, the it's, it's in the middle, but but over the top at the same time. He's not. It, it, it's his natural television personality, apparently, and it's the worst I've ever seen. On any local TV, people doing news on cable, Spectrum Channel One, are more professional. It he doesn't need to do this. I'm here in the restaurant. We're going to try to capture them. Oh, look, we could do it just by turning to the left. How no turning to the left, here. and there they are. <laughs> and it, it's like the fucking, in the fucking 70s cop shows when you could follow somebody 20 feet behind them and they'd never see you, and you'd never lose them in traffic. This is all Jericho unleashed. That's what this is. Marvez, Callis, with Jericho, this is all Jericho. Well, but there, there's, there's more to come. Okay, let's talk about... What they're doing with our boy, and I, I think he's got Stockholm syndrome at this point because he's he's clearly loving it. He's all the way on board with this. But MJF, the AEW World Heavyweight Champion, the guy that is theoretically supposed to be carrying the money matches in the main event of the pay per views, along with CM Punk, who is, as we mentioned, MJF's the biggest star. Punk is the biggest name in the company. The biggest star has to be the world champion. But Punk's the biggest name. But does either one of them need to be doing goddamn Laurel and Hardy? And MJF is now going to, or soon, find out, I think, that you can be a victim of your excessive talent. Everything he does is good <laughs> and entertaining in some kind of way, even if it's even if it's this shit that they're doing, nobody in the world could do this any better than him. However, you'll find out that when you can do everything well, there will be more and more excuses for sales pitches for you to do stupid shit that you ain't got any business doing long term for the health of your goddamn aura if nothing else and as we've said he's he's the people will i would think when he becomes a full-fledged devil again the people will still boo him because they they know they're supposed to and they appreciate everything he does so they're going to work with him but he's rapidly ingratiating himself in a way that people really had some fucking dislike if not if grudging respect for what he was doing before but now he's just gonna i don't know and it's it it's not even mjf and adam cole 
interacting with each other in an entertaining and funny way that you could believe is organic between the two of them, but it's obviously a 80s buddy movie takeoff shot like that with scripting and supporting cast and multiple camera angles, and they're just doing this to pull our puds. And I don't think as legitimately believable as he is, he ought to be involved in silliness that's also obviously fake. Talk to me and then we'll talk about the details. I commend your use of the word pud on a wrestling podcast in 2023. Are we talking about the buddy segment or the match? I'm not even sure. Well, the, the buddy segment is what came first. And then the match was shortly to follow. I'll save my match comments for my match comments. I guess with the buddy stuff, like it's not for me. And I agree with what you said before. MJF's really talented. If there was like an MJF 30 minute show with 22 minutes with commercials, just him doing skits or whatever, I would watch it. I'd probably like it if it's good. But in the middle of the wrestling show, I'm not a big fan of these things. Now, again, I'm not a big fan of it. This is one of those things that the AEW fans are reacting to. Every week, it's getting the highest number in the key demo. Every week, the rating for the MJF Cole segment is typically the highest of the show. I got to double check this week because they did have a big match that went close to an hour or whatever it was. Yeah. But I'm not a big fan of this. Now, I think also this let, is... Let me ask you just an editor's note. Yeah. MJF was the highest rated segment of the show a lot of times before he was doing this, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So, okay, never go, continue. Well, the other thing is, I think clearly, like you said, these guys are having a good time with it. And AEW is about nothing if not wrestlers having a good time doing things. So when you say they're talking MJF into it, I would have to think that if he's doing it, it's something he wants to do. Well, no, that's why I said that he's got a little Stockholm syndrome because he's jumped in with both feet. And, and I, I didn't... And, you I know, didn't I, and I think this is also... This is babyface MJF, not, you know, when Moxley and Jericho and various people wanted him to be a babyface, when you started seeing, like, interviews, Jericho is the most prominent one about MJF should be a babyface. It wouldn't have worked then. It's working. The babyface reactions he's getting now are different than what he was getting then, and it's more, the fans are kind of taking to him now, and I think he's kind of going with it. Yes. And long term, uh, because again, the money match still needs to be Punk and MJF. And uh, nevertheless, back who to says this. MJF has to be the heel? Well, depends on where they have it, doesn't it? But uh, we're just oh my god. The point is, I liked the match they had, and and we're not even talking about the match yet. But just as an example of what you were saying. There's a difference in they're going a little fucking far. I'm not saying they shouldn't do a thing where MJF and Adam Cole bond somehow and they're doing the drama with Roddy, Roderick Strong, who said, how, Adam, how can you trust this fucking guy? And we've talked about Adam Cole will look like an idiot if MJF stabs him in the back after all this. Adam Cole would probably get over better if he ends up turning heel and joining MJF, if Roddy is the, the MacGuffin that allows Adam Cole to turn heel and stab an old friend in the back to go with MJF, that's great. But if Roddy's the one that turns heel on Adam Cole because he's friends with, then that's insane. But I'm not saying they shouldn't do the other option like is The other option is they all join together. Well, and, and then you've got, but they have to be, they pretty much have to be heels to do that. I mean, it, Are they heels right now? No, they're the biggest baby faces. And, and here's the thing. They've, they've come up with a team that FTR is going to have to wrestle. It might be the only team that they'll cheer over FTR, their biggest baby face team in the whole company. It's, ah, but what I'm saying is I'm not saying they shouldn't do this angle in some kind. And I like the tag team match that they had the other week where they did some basic, simple shit and pop the people, but at the same time, it wasn't blatantly phony and silliness, which this week was. And the bit in Kowloon's, where MJF is 
taken by Adam Cole to get over his fear of eating spicy food, and then they get drunk. And MJF is telling the story over and over of slamming Big Bill like it was Andre and Hulk. And then they hit the double clothesline on a waiter. They don't really hit it. They're running at the waiter, and you see the freeze frame of the waiter's shocked expression from their viewpoint, and then see them coming, and it's a freeze and fade to black. That's fake. They didn't beat up the waiter at Kowloon. He's, uh, MJF is becoming one of the clowns on the show instead of the ringmaster. And that's the thing. I'm not saying they shouldn't do an angle like this. I'm saying when they do this phony, silly shit that everybody cooperated on, it just drives home into people's mind that this is something they're doing to, to pull our pud. And, you know, maybe we might want to see what's going to happen, but it makes him one of the clowns instead of the fucking ringmaster, the main event guy that you don't think should be doing obviously phony shit to pull your pud. He should be pulling your pud with shit you can't tell's phony. <sighs> Bar Brady got tipped off that Jericho and Phallus were arriving. And it just so happened that as he was standing in the parking lot saying that he got tipped off that they were arriving, they were pulling up over his left shoulder in their car. And Marvez even runs fake. Did you see him try to run? Seriously, it's not even that he's Jericho's friend. He's Tony's friend. And because of that, they keep jamming him on the show. Marvez from day one when they had him on the mic has not worked. He's not on air or on voice. He should not be a character on this show. And we're not saying he's a bad person. He's been a journalist uh, with a real newspaper for many years now. And everybody likes him. That's not the point. Yeah, when you have to read him, not when you have to watch him. Well, yeah, you shouldn't. You know, if everybody likes your grandma, she shouldn't be interviewing people on national television either. And that's the only qualification he has for this job is that everybody likes him. And he and he's embarrassing himself. And he And it again, makes people look at each other and go, this fucking show. <clears throat> Britt Baker beat Betty Nobody. And then Renee Moxley Good was in the back with Adam Cole and MJF about their match coming up. And Adam says they've caught lightning in a bottle. They're going to win the tag team title. And MJF presents Adam Cole with matching trunks. And Adam Cole presents him with matching jackets. And they start to go out for their match. And Roddy comes in after him like, Adam, Adam, like, come back, Shane, Shane, come back. <clears throat> so now should we talk about the match? Let's talk about the match. The match was MJF and... Adam Cole versus Sammy Guevara and Daniel Garcia, the finals of the Blind Eliminator Tag Team Tournament. Yes, and Jericho was out there for color, although the way he does it these days is more like black and white. Unbearable commentary, show-wide, but especially this match. And MJF and Adam come out and do the exaggerated buddy entrance where now the extra special shockingness is that they didn't transition to Adam Cole's music. He came out to MJF's and they went all the way to the, and MJF was showing his love and gratitude for that. And then MJF and Garcia got in the middle of the ring and started dancing at each other because Garcia did his little, his version of Rick Rude's fucking hip swirl or whatever the fuck it is he's doing. And MJF did it back, and then Garcia, and then MJF, and Garcia, and MJF. And then MJF goes to the floor and goes down to the fake audio board that's set up at ringside to be a fake audio board and presses one button on it. Because, of course, he's also, in addition to being the greatest promo in wrestling and the AEW world champion, he's a goddamn audio engineer. And not only does music start playing, but the lights go down and they get a disco effect. And Garcia and Guevara start dancing with each other. And they do what can only be described, I guess, Brian, as a choreographed duo dance routine that they 
probably spend a little time on. Would that be an appropriate description of this? I don't know if there is an appropriate description, but that would be a description. That would be a description of what the events that occurred. Uh, propriety be damned. And then MJF starts dancing. And, and of course, the people are loving all of this. For the kind of people who like that kind of thing, those kind of people were in this building. And he dances. I guess, you know, he can sing, he can dance, he can tell jokes, he can... God damn, he can core a apple. He can do it all. And then they have Adam Cole. And Adam Cole gets out there, and he starts dancing like the male version of Elaine on Seinfeld and gets himself worked up into some kind of fervor where it looked like he was trying to jack off a super so soaker. And then the music stops with a record scratch. That was... <laughs> that was cringy. Where did that come from? Well, because somebody has to even make a hat on a hat. The Let's fake soundboard more cute. The fake soundboard's one thing. A fake record scratch. There's no record player. There's no record being played. It's exactly. Record scratch and Adam Cole still into it, and Garcia and Guevara jump him. And I wrote, "Will this be the first ever MJF segment to run off viewers like a pockets match?" And at this point, I have to say that they had done the impossible and made me not give a shit about MJF. And I, did, I just put this on speed search at that point. Because I, I it, what the fuck? And I'm sure whatever the rest of the shit that they did was, the people in the building loved it. And I'm sure that they're going to continue to love it. But, God damn it, I can't watch this fucking fake silliness with children. It's, if nothing else, disrespectful to the wrestling business, but also, again, long-term, not good. Not good, as Frank Faceman Hickey would say. What did you think of the match and or the dancing and dance fever? What about it, Denny Terrio? You know, I really enjoyed the match last week and the crowd helped make it because they got so into the idea of MJF and Cole and they were reacting to everything against Big Bill and Brian Cage. I really liked that. Yeah. They had a big crowd. I mean, it was Boston. It was their biggest dynamite in a very long time. And it was a hot crowd that would react to a lot of things. And like I said before, I think Adam Cole and MJF must be having a good time with this and they're going to ride that wave and they're thinking of the now, not any long-term repercussions, which there may or may not be. I mean, who knows? But, you know, I was looking forward to this. I mean, beyond the comedy, the idea of Cole and MJF coming off last week's match working with Guevara and Garcia could have been something, and instead it turned into the dance-off. The Garcia dancing thing, I guess, they're trying to get it over. Some adult told him he should start doing that all the time. <laughs> It's one thing when you do it on the entrance. Rick Rude didn't constantly throughout the match gyrate his hips in the face of the fucking wrestlers. It was well, nonstop. And, and no, in, in, and it, but in the instances he did, they weren't standing there then doing a goddamn Tennessee do -si do in response to it. We're going to get That's MJF and Cole versus FTR out of this. I'm looking forward to that. I'm hoping we get more of the FTR two out of three falls match kind of milieu and vibe and feel of that match than we do this. But I think on this show, this episode specifically, which was a ridiculous episode, you know, it just felt like it, it worked there, but it didn't work for me at all. I, I, I'm like you. This was kind of one of those very rare These MJF segments where I can't, I can't say I liked it. I can't pretend it's good. I really, really didn't like it. These were the people who, who come to see the silliness. These are the people who come to see the, the wrestlers that make fun of wrestling. And, the, and they, they appeal to that audience, and then I guess Boston is now a hotbed of that. Yeah. But what, where, when I was hoping, MJF being the world champion should be able to appear on either show, Saturday or Wednesday, I'm thinking, after the last few weeks, 
if they could put MJF on the wrestling show on Saturday night, this thing could be the goddamn best show that anybody's done in years and years on a regular basis. And instead of putting him on the wrestling show, he's driving the clown car. All right. And they got Cole and him working in their t-shirts, which is good. Because beyond <laughs> the fact that apparently it's the best-selling AEW t-shirt of the entire year so far, it covers up any of Cole's issues. So that's good. In that case, I think he ought to wear one of those fucking pleated inflatable wintertime parkas they, they have in the Arctic oh. to give him some upper body. Well, Kenny knows where to get the inflatable thing, so maybe you can check with him. Yeah, the problem is, I don't think Kenny has the breath to blow him up anymore. All right, it was one hour, basically, left in the program. And at that point, they had to start gall and bile. I mean, blood and guts. And obviously, because it's War Games rules, if not an actual War Games, that was one of their shortcomings also, you know it's going to go some amount of time because the first two guys have to start and then they stagger the entrances every couple of minutes, etc. So you know that there's it's going to be a long match and go, you know, some level of time because it always has due to the stipulation. But my God, my God, on and on and on and on, the garbage match didn't stop until the break of dawn. And they, again, because they can put, you know, all of Tony's money and resources and that they've got the giant cage and they've got the goddamn production and the big building so that they can do all this shit and they just can't get out of the goddamn rec center. They have to do the narrow-casted, small-minded, indie outlaw niche style of wrestling that most people are going to look at and either go what are these fucking fake kids playing or in the same match look at these disgusting fucking circus freaks slicing themselves up and they accomplished both of those things at the same time you want to go down the play-by-play -play before we discuss the preposterosity of it, Brian? And there was so much preposterosity, or whatever the hell you just said. But let me just say that uh, this was also the first War Games I've ever seen where every entrant got their own... Their music played and they got yes. to run out as opposed to being around the cage. Well, that's because everybody's such a big star. They, and they also, they had to be out there even longer because... Everybody had to have an entrance, including all of the plumbers people had to come from the goddamn parking lot, through the arena, past the concession stand, down past the EMT station, and across from the fucking beer cooler. And they just elongate everything, and they won't fucking... Nothing beats anybody. There were people thrown on it. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to spoil it. I just, I thought, again, the uh, Claudio and Twinkle Toes started out first. And I noted the teams aren't ringside, so you can't see the animosity building, and you can't see one team in one corner, one team in the other corner, standing by their doors, thinking, okay, you know, we've got strategy here. You're going to go in next to counter this guy. It's just a goddamn showbiz shit show. And... Again, Claudio's a great worker, and he's been buried in this whole thing, and so there's something else they might could have done something with. The rings were dark because the cage was fucking up the lighting, so you had shadows everywhere. Again, everything that... Did you hear the fans chanting, use this ring? Because I guess the fans on the far side hadn't gotten any action all night. Well, yeah, and see, that's another part of the problem, is that... <laughs> They had, uh, primarily when you do these two ring things, but it's television, you can't put your goddamn hard camera on a fucking sliding trolley, so they have to use the one ring for all the other one ring matches because the hard camera would be off center, and then the people over there, they're looking through a complete empty ring to see the other, you see where I'm going with that. Anyway, um... So, number three is Pac, 
who comes in through the arena menacingly in no hurry to help. And I guess we should mention the teams are obviously the BBC and everybody affiliated with them against the EVPs with their bosom buddy and lifelong chum from Japan, Kota Ibushi, and uh, that's the the pairings in this, but obviously they're staggering the entrances. Number four was Hangnail Page. Number five, here come the plumber. And to this point, they'd been having a fight in a cage. There was nothing particularly that offensive about anything. But of course, Moxley brings new meaning to the word offensive whenever he comes in. He comes in the cage and starts stabbing Page and Twinkle Toes with a fork in the head and stomach and mouth. By the way, this is the day after that Abdullah the Butcher Dark Side of the Ring aired. Yeah. And it's the week after Tony's memo about things that puncture you. And also, none of them bled at that point. He stabbed a bunch of people in the head. They didn't bleed forever after that. Then he brought in a bucket of what was purported to be broken glass and dumped it in the ring. This early in the match. And people were taking bumps in it. And I'm sorry. But now, I've, even though I know these people are fucking complete idiots, especially Moxley, and I'm sure he wanted to use real glass, that was phony fucking glass because they were rolling around in it. Yes, a few people had a couple scratches on their back. You can get those from Legos. But you couldn't roll around in real broken glass like that without slicing yourself severely. And it was there for fucking 30 minutes in the middle of the ring. And so that was his contribution to coming in hot. And then it was Nicky Buckaroo who drop kicked the plumber into his own broken glass. And then he took a bump in the glass. And I, at that point, I wrote, this is now everything wrong with modern wrestling. It's fake and dangerous at the same time. Silly and nonsensical while trying to simulate violence that nobody believes because it's so obviously preposterous. But guys are really getting hurt. And it devalues everything that guys with legitimate talent might do in front of these fans in terms of angles or finishes or whatever because nothing beats these fucking emaciated-looking, minute, pudgy, out-of-shape or unknown fucking morons. You got a whole collection of them in there. Fits all of those descriptions. Can't kill them. Then here comes Wheeler Useless with a chair, and they went to the break before he even got to the ring. Wheeler Useless has to come through the arena because he's a member of the BBC. It seemed like there was a lot of stuff happening in picture in picture, but it was so, I mean, it's picture in picture. There's only so much you could do to watch this. Well, and besides they're shooting two rings with a cage around it, there's fucking uh, close to 10 guys, about to be 10, and they're going to picture in picture while they're all just randomly fighting on and on. Again, as I said, there used to be some element of logic and psychology to these matches. During the entrances, the baby face shined when it was one on one or one against one, or the odds were even. When the heel had the man advantage, then they took over and got some heat so you could blow a comeback. And then once everybody got in there, then you could fight all around. This is just chaos from the word go. And so it, it gets so repetitive so quickly. And then when Matty Buckaroo came in and made his road warrior comeback, I noticed now the plumber was bleeding. And, you know, they, they didn't get blood from the screwdrivers and the broken glass, but then people were bleeding randomly. Osmosis. And then Take a Shit comes in with a chair. So they can't even be original. Just every member of that team just comes in with a fucking chair. And then the plumber went underneath the rig and pulled out, I swear to God, they called it a bed of nails. But it was a bed of screwdrivers. It was huge metal-looking 
spikes or whatever, obviously, again, not razor sharp or even sharp, hopefully dulled by a machinist, because people were taking body slams on them and not being punctured. I think Moxley eventually bladed his back, but nobody else that took bumps on it had multiple holes in them. But again, that's when Moxley body slammed Kenny onto it. He wasn't impaled or bleeding, but Moxley's there covered in blood from what he's done to himself, and he gets to live out his fantasy of being a circus sideshow geek without even bringing in the live chicken. And then you got a, they got a shot real briefly of Kenny trying to t get up after a bump. He turned over and put his bare hand on the bed of nails trying to push himself up. And then Moxley was standing on it. And then finally, number 10, the number 10 man who got a big introduction while all this carnage is going on with supposedly nine main event guys in this company. They stop everything to give a lengthy ring introduction and video to this fucking, again, outlaw doll wrestler from Japan that's friends with Kenny, Kota Ibushi, another candidate, another fucking Muppet, as they say over in the British Isles that people think is a, the world's greatest wrestling artist to these people. And here he comes, a doughy fucking nondescript fucking putz. You know, that is part of the story right there. It's interesting. He hasn't wrestled in a while. He's never wrestled for AEW. Again, this is not really his style of wrestling. But if you're into his doll wrestling or beyond that, things he's done, this kind of match isn't it. He showed up, and I've watched him before. Remember, he was in the Cruiserweight Classic. Before AEW started for I, NXT? I, I don't remember that, no. Well, he was in shape. He was always in really good shape. He was cut. He had abs. This is the guy who showed up here, and to say he wasn't impressive in the match or impressive looking would be an understatement. This is like a completely different Kota Ibushi. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm waiting to see this fucking meteorite flying across the sky, and I get a goddamn burnout fucking charcoal ember from a cookout besides his appearance which i don't care he didn't do anything he didn't do a goddamn thing except stupid shit he strolled out to the ring well wheeler useless left the cage with his team to meet this guy in the aisle to get knocked out with a punch yeah what was the point of that well to i'm sure kenny thought it'd be just great and then this dickhead strolls to the ring and just walks to the ring with no fire, no enthusiasm, no, I'm going to come in and kick ass, save the day, whatever. And he gets in and throws one punch each and just knocks out three of the heels. Is, that his, is he the man with the hands of stone in fucking Japan? No. Well, a good thing, because then he and Moxley had their big stare down, you know, Japanese legend versus legend in his own deluded, warped brain. And right as Taz is talking about Coda's striking ability, he's on top of Moxley throwing punches that are so fake and so far away from the guy's head that the director had to cut away from it. The big fucking confrontation between these two and he gets on Moxley, and it's so bad looking, the director cut to nondescript guys fighting in the corner. And then everybody started fighting again. And two of these weasels were in the entrance way. It's a fucking cage match, and they're fighting in the hat on a hat. And then Moxley bumped on the bed of nails. And then Kenny, no, it was it was Coda. Coda and Kenny. Coda moonsaulted him on it, but it was a standing moonsault. You know, I don't know if this is another guy that could climb up to the top rope or not. Is he broken down too, or he just didn't give a fuck? I wouldn't be surprised if he's pretty broken down. He's been wrestling a 
Kota Ibushi type style for a long time. Well, good. Then it's the Kota Ibushi type. If this is Kota Ibushi style, I've seen him wrestle blow up dolls, six year old girls, and this. If this is his style, he needs to quit. He also threw a kick, hit, take a shit, and fell right on his own ass. Got off balance. And again, they they kept going to the break, and then they'd come back at one point. Maddie and Useless were on top of the cage, and they were doing Northern Lights suplexes to each other. I said, it's almost 40 minutes at this point. And then Matt, Matt Buckaroo, is up on the roof of the cage and takes a bag from somewhere and dumps thousands of thumbtacks into the cage so some of the other chicken biters can take a bump in them. And I wrote, did, God, this is the most self-indulgent bullshit. What the fuck? Go ahead. Did you hear, like, Scalber plug blood donations? All these guys oh, were on yes. the fucking roof of the cage? Yes, during this, they were plugging in. But remember, donate blood to the Red Cross. I wouldn't donate blood now to the Red Cross just on the theory I wouldn't want any of these motherfuckers to have it if they needed it. To commemorate Shark Week, donate your blood. To commemorate this goddamn brain-damaged imbecile that we fucking indulge in his delusions, celebrate that, him cutting himself over and over on our television program in front of God and everybody, go give blood. So then Nikki slides a table into the ring. And I wrote again, hat on a hat. It's like Dr. Seuss wrote this match. And the fans started chanting, we want fire. So that's where they're at. That is that is how that this company has educated its wrestling fans. When they're seeing all this fucking shit already, they're chanting, we want fire. And they would be disappointed. Yes, they would. And then they did some uh, choreography. We had some Broadway in there. Four superplexes at the same time on different people, not right after another. Uh, by different people, on different people, and then a table break to conclusion. So four super superplexes and a table break has replaced two turntables and a microphone. There were a lot of moments in this match where someone would have someone in the corner that'd be up uh, on the second rope, you know, hitting him or whatever, but they would always pause and look behind them waiting for whatever they were expecting, whatever they were waiting for. So that happened several times. Well, because they've, they've set the whole thing up, obviously. And speaking of obvious setups, then they went for the 10-way phony punch fight where they think because there's 10 guys in the ring all allegedly punching each other that you won't look at any individual and see that it looks fucking fake. They're just swinging aimlessly. They're creating meaningless motion. And then everybody hit everybody. And then they got four simultaneous submission holes and a big swing. And I wrote that Coda looks like some guy from the college swim team that wandered in. Uh, he's wearing the fucking swim trunks and just, uh, what the, f what? <laughs> Again, I wrote, where's the greatness? So then Claudio and Pac got in an argument because Claudio hit Pac by mistake when he was charging in the corner and the other guy moved. So, Pac, explain this to me. He went and got bolt cutters and walked out of the, and cut the lock on the cage door and walked out of the match and slammed the door on Claudio's head. If they needed bolt cutters to get out, how were the two guys fighting in the entrance way and how were the two other guys on the roof a minute ago? That's a great question. They just, because uh, the bolt cutter spot will be cool. You got to use bolt cutters. Okay. But meanwhile, the other guys didn't want to give up their spots that they thought were cool. So they just did them anyway. And then, you know what happened? They had already been going almost an hour. And as Pac walked out, it was the end of the show and my DVR froze because the show was scheduled to be over. And they gave this fiasco an hour and it still wasn't enough for them. So what happened after that? Because all besides Pac walking out, did Take a Shit not walk out on him also from what I read? Yeah, Don Callis pulled Take a Shit, uh, Takeshita out of the match to, uh, he saw it was a losing 
thing, so he pulled his guy from the losing team. Moxley submitted, but it wasn't anything happening to Moxley. Moxley submitted on behalf of Wheeler Yuta, who was being choked out. Oh, to save him. To save him. Because Moxley is so beneficent and benevolent. Hey, give him credit. If there's anyone you want to say he's been that way too, it's Wheeler Yuta. <sighs> yeah, to put him on a fucking television. So, so you ended then, the match with the five baby faces in the ring and three heels. Yes. Yes, they did. And apparently after all this was over with, it was the topic of Twitter in addition to lighting everything up because people going, what the fuck is this clown show bullshit that they showed on the air? Then... Whenever they went off the air, apparently both teams stayed in the ring to shake hands with each other after they'd been stabbing each other in the heads with screwdrivers and fucking throwing each other onto beds of nails. Good sportsmanship. They shook hands with each other. Sportsmanship. And then to put a period on the, or maybe even an exclamation point on the evening, Oh, Kota Ibushi, for no reason, no purpose whatsoever, just took his own flat back bump into the thumbtacks and then jumped up not selling it and rah rah everybody. And the clip of that go is going around and there were even people you hear in the building going, why, Kota, why? And what is he doing? He's an idiot. He killed the thumbtack bump. That, <laughs> God damn it. Like you, the thing that you shouldn't be doing anyway, but if you're going to do it, you ought to act like it hurts. And he killed the thumbtack bump. Because they're all fucking mental cases and they don't give a shit. And they think their shit don't stink. And there were people defending. Well, it was off the air. It was in front of 12,000 fucking people in Boston. Everyone with a camera in their pocket. Yes. Oh, but it wasn't on the TV show. They just did that off the air for fun. Yeah, fuck you and your fun. As a matter of fact, that should be a quote that goes around from me and a meme. Fuck you and your fun. Jesus Christ. So this was an hour of television of a bunch of reform school students and maladjusted misfits jacking themselves off under pretense of being in the wrestling business, doing every outlaw indie mud show wrestling cliche they could over and over until it was over with, with the added component of Moxley continuing to mutilate himself for no good reason and no fucking financial returns on the show because he does it all the time and it means nothing except to him and he enjoys it. So he does it. And the boss can't tell him not to because the boss has no balls. Your thoughts? I thought it was awful. I thought it was just completely terrible and not for me. I don't think this feud has worked. Again, it was a hot crowd, so they were into it. They were in the Kota Ibushi and he came out and he looked terrible in my eyes. Didn't impress anyone. Couldn't have impressed anyone. Why would you even debut him in this kind of match? I guess in their heads, it justifies everything they've done that they've ended. Literally, the coda, I guess, would be this match. But I thought this was terrible. What, uh, what star rating do you think it got from The Observer? Oh, come on. I mean, what, what star rating would it get from anybody with eyes, or what did it get from Dave? It had to get five stars from Dave. Four and three quarter stars, but according to Dave, that's just as good as five stars. Just as good. What do you, well, think, what do you think FTR... Bullet Club Gold, two out of three falls, got in the Observer. The best tag team match of at least modern time? Yes. Four and a half. Five and a quarter. Ooh, so he's trying to allay some of the criticism. Good for Uncle Dave. Again, why Actually, would... Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just so stupid that five star is in the end, that now it's just yeah. all of a sudden a quarter. It's a quarter better... Then yeah, but, but, but see now, but he can say, but look, I gave somebody else besides my best friends five stars. I even gave him five and a quarter. That's even better than five, except it's the same thing. So we still have to talk 
Before we move on to the world of the bloodline, we have to talk about the ratings that the fiasco that AEW presented last Wednesday night for Blood and Guts scored. Uh, okay, they had they had every goddamn major alleged star that they have dedicated the Wednesday night television program to for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. The, the BBC, the Buckaroos and their pals, the blood and gut, the two ring, guaranteed carnage, chaos, and vivisection match. And one would think that they would have done the largest rating that they have done in recent weeks or months for something like that. One would suppose it's been built up and promoted. And also one would think that this week, they would have broken their usual tradition of hemorrhaging viewers as the show goes on because the big blood and guts match where they gave all the blood and guts was on last and people should have hung around to see that theoretically. Now I do not know because of the thing that I believe I mentioned earlier in this program before we did a little time traveling and I haven't had much sleep over the last few days. I've been working on a fucking project. So you are going to enlighten me now, Brian Last, as to what the ratings were for this Wednesday, past Wednesday night without me ever having any predetermined knowledge of this important bullshit that we're about to talk about. Well, this important bullshit was AEW Dynamite, Blood and Guts, July 19th. The email from WrestleNomics is blood and guys. I think he has a misprint here. <laughs> blood and guts, July 19th. TBS was watched on average by 953,000 viewers. 953,000. So they did. They hopped themselves up on their blood and their guts, their plasma and their uterine samples. 100,000 people more than normal. Well, the show opened quarter one, 8 to 8.15 p.m. Jack Perry's tryout for Breaking Bad, followed by Hook versus Jack Perry with picture in picture, 952,000 viewers. Aha! So this indicates that they are going to keep and indeed possibly gain some of these people. Well, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Hook versus Perry the Adam Cole MJF buddy video, an ad break, Don Callis and Chris Jericho captured in a restaurant by Alex Marvez, and Kayla Sparks versus Britt Baker, 915,000 viewers. Okay, so they lost 37,000 on that because that was a great variety of not very gripping television. Quarter 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., Adam Cole, MJF, and Roderick Strong's backstage angle, and the beginning of Adam Cole and MJF versus Daniel Garcia and Sammy Guevara with picture in picture, 977,000 viewers. Woo! So, hand it off to MJF and Mr. Cole for their continuing saga, and they get 62,000 back. Not even back, but their 37,000 they lost and another uh, 25,000. The next quarter, quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m., the continuation of Cole and MJF versus Garcia and Guevara with the post-match with Chris Jericho and Garcia and Guevara. Uh, FTR, just as FTR, I don't remember what it was. Did it do a promo or what, whatever it was? FTR and an ad break, 967,000 viewers, and also the high point during the scheduled two hours for the key demo, 464. Hmm, so they lost 10,000. At that point, that's bathroom breakage material, if that. But again, like we've said, the Cole MJF stuff, I'm not really happy about it. However, the fans are reacting to it, and more than importantly, it's popping the youth number in terms of their viewers. But well, it's, it's MJF performing anything. At this point, I think he could you know, fart in their general direction and pick up viewers. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, nine to nine, 15 p.m. The best friends, Orange Cassidy, Chris Statlander, Darby Allen, Nick Wayne backstage angle. 
The Blackpool Combat Club. I think I managed to fast forward all the way through that. The Blackpool Combat Club Golden Elite video, entrances, an ad break, and the beginning of Blood and Guts, the Blackpool Combat Club with Takeshita and Pack versus the Golden Elite, 957. Thousand viewers. Jesus Christ, they lost 10,000 at the top of the hour for the start of the fucking end of the world? All right, that's surprising. Quarters. I mean, that's that's still, I just called 10,000 people a bathroom breakage, but that's fluctuation in what was already going on. This is the start of, all right, never, nevertheless. Well, quarter six, the continuation of the blood and guts match. With picture in picture twice, this is the high point of the two-hour scheduled show, 980,000 viewers. Okay, so they picked up another 23,000 there. Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. Once again, the continuation of Blood and Guts with picture in picture, 945,000 viewers. Jesus Christ! Okay, maybe they're... Proving our point. And finally, and there's going to be an overrun here, I tell you too. Quarter 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m. The conclusion of Blood and Guts with Picture in Picture, 928,000 viewers. <laughs> and the overrun from 10 to 10.03 p.m., 980,000 viewers. And but how long was the overrun? Three minutes. Okay, so no. You don't get <laughs> you don't get the credit for three of the three minutes of the fifteen minutes. It's only if it goes past seven and a half, right? Do you really get the credit for? They're doing this a lot lately, though, with overruns with AEW trying to. I don't know if they're doing it to try to increase the number or whatever the reason it's, is. It's an artificial inflation if that's if they're averaging nine fifty three and factoring that in. Because no, suddenly on a declining. On a declining ratings pattern over 45 minutes from quarter six, seven, or uh, yes, quarter six, seven, and eight. Yeah. That you don't suddenly get credit for th a three minute overrun that people are tuning into the scheduled program that suddenly boosts you 52,000 for three minutes. No. Especially since every other top of the quarter they had been fucking tuning out since that thing started. That's. <sighs> They kept the majority of their audience on this program. If you look at the top of the, of the show to the bottom of the show, but if you take the blood and guts one hour and look at it by itself, they still, over the course of that match with those people, lost viewers. <laughs> they, and from their high point to the finish of the main event of the most Important match in the history of blah, blah, blah. They lost 52,000 people. Still not the major percentage that they normally do, uh, to be quite fair. And they managed to not even lose 5% or so from the start to the finish of the thing. And they got an extra 100,000 people from what they do every week. So kudos to them. But the nearly the high point came, the high point in the first hour came when MJF and Adam Cole got together. And the high point in the second half came in pretty much the first goddamn 15 minutes of that cage fiasco. And as the longer it went, the more people tuned out. What does that say to you, considering the amount of TV time that's been spent on the Elite versus Blackpool Combat Club feud that Cole and MJF, who are at this point doing comedy and just doing... The other, the other guys are falling in broken glass and thumbtacks and slicing their heads with razor blades, and they can't get to fucking viewership of... A dance Goddamn contest. Olsen and Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe, they could, maybe they could come out and do Mac and Moran. It would work. Um, it, it shows that... They promoted this this television show, this big event, this night of chaos and mayhem and comedy, and people tuned in for it, and they loved 
MJF and Adam Cole, and they were kind of hanging around to wait to see the, you know, the, the blood and guts thing. And as the blood and guts thing went on and on and on, people got less and less interested instead of more and more. Wasn't it? The, I mean, forgive me if I'm wrong, but last week, over the course of an hour on Saturday night, didn't FTR and Gin and Juice actually pick up people interested in what was going on when they heard about it? Yes, they did. Well, this was the opposite effect. Because as we all know from going to grade school, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. They put on a good match and people tuned in. They put on a stinky match and people said fuck it and started tuning out. Would you like to hear a preview of this Wednesday's AEW Dynamite from Albany, probably, New York? Probably not, but I have a feeling I'm going to anyway. Well, here's the lineup as currently announced as we are recording. For the AEW International Championship, Orange Cassidy versus <sighs> A.R. Fox. Oh, joy. We'll hear from MJF and Adam Cole. Also, <laughs> <laughs> that's all. You, just, just put up MJF. It just says we'll hear from them. Yeah, that's all you need. There'll be a big match with the man who defeated Commander at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view this past week. Pack will be going up against Gravity. <laughs> and if you didn't see the Ring of Honor pay-per-view results, Commander lost to Gravity. There is a wrestler named Gravity who's defeating the ridiculous high flying. And then, and then after Pac battles Gravity, he'll grapple with logic. Wait until he gets the jealousy. That's going to be the feud I want. <laughs> Pac versus jealousy. <laughs> also on the show, I've never seen Gravity, so I can't say anything too much about him. I've never seen it either, but I hear it works on apples. Sean Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli. Oh, versus boy. the Lucha Brothers versus Best Friends. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's, it's going to be like if the Bowery Boys all went to wrestling school at the same time. And not even Leo Gorsi and Hunts Hall, but the other ones with Billy Hallop. But anyway, Darby <laughs> Allen versus Swerve Strickland. And finally, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, versus Taya Valkyrie. Well, there you go, boy. It probably won't take us long next week to talk about collision, folk, or talk about dynamite, rather. All things, I was going to say all things considered, but taking everything into the <laughs> equation. I'd rather not consider all these things. Considering they're coming off this big blood and guts match, surprising that we're not having more stuff on this show announced in advance concerning the people actually involved in a match other than Claudio and Moxley being in a random three-way tag match. I don't know, because I zip through all the goddamn announcements anyway. Because it's just meaningless, multiple names being shouted out as quickly as possible with all these stipulations and convoluted things that only people that need medication in order to control themselves can possibly keep track of. Well, that's AEW Dynamite coming this Wednesday from Albany, New York. Tickets start at $10 million. <laughs> right now, wherever you find your favorite tickets. And you know what? You know what, Brian? I've mentioned to you. I've mentioned to you how that I've deprived myself of sleep over the last few days, this little outside project I've had going on. And that's a bad thing to do. It's a bad thing to deprive yourself of sleep. And that's why we talk about our fine friends and advertisers and sponsors, including the people from Helix Sleep. That's right. That help everybody get a better night's sleep, for heaven's sake. As a matter of fact, you know this, I believe I told you this off the air. Felt your feather bottom. You know, he's had a problem sleeping. You know, you know, I've told the, the listeners, maybe some of the lewd, new listeners. Some of the lewd listeners. They listen in the lewd. Some of the new <laughs> listeners might not know about the feather bottom family. They know about Hotchkiss because he mails, you know, all of the, the merchandise and he runs the website. He's the guy that invented the screenshot and the email blast and things like that. Well, his aunt and uncle, Aunt Fanny and Uncle Felcher, they help in the, in the in enterprise also. They're boxing things. They're packing stuff up. But Felcher Featherbottom has had problems sleeping for some time. I'll have you know, Brian, that every morning that he wakes up, the first thing that happens when he opens his eyes is he has, he regurgitates vomit all over the place. 
And it, it, the doctors have changed. It doesn't happen any other time of day. It doesn't happen, at, you know, at any other point except he first wakes up and he opens his eyes and, <gasps> and boy, even though they try what? to clean, it starts smelling. What are you so, talking about? Well, I'm telling you, he's got that problem with vomit regurgitation all over the place first thing in the morning. So what he does yeah. is he goes to the doctor to check him out, and they say, we can't find anything wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you physically. It must be something the way you're sleeping, because it only happens first thing when you wake up and you open your eyes. So he takes us for, obviously, for the gospel, everything that we say is true. And he heard one of our Helix Sleep ads, and I'll have you know that he went to helixsleep.com, and he looked through the incredible variety of mattresses they have. For example, we've talked about the Elite Collection that have six different mattress models, each one of them tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. If you like it hard, they'll give it to you. And if you like it soft, you can waller around in it. And every Helix Elite mattress comes with a 15-year manufacturer warranty. They've got, they've all, all the mattresses have the 100-night free trial, so you can bring it into your home, do pretty much bloody anything you want to on it. You can sleep on it. And if you don't like it, then you can send it back. But you're going to like it. Your money back. But well, nobody does that, because how rude would you be? You get the finest mattress that God has ever put on his green earth, and then you, just like a an ungrateful pig, you would send it back. Nobody's that picky. These things are perfect. And they support the military at Helix and first responders, teachers, and students. They give them special discounts on the site. Well, by the time you get past military, first responders, teachers, students, gee, that's almost everybody. Because almost everybody's teaching somebody something, and the people that aren't, well, they're almost all learning something. Except for the Trumpers, they don't learn anything. But and a lot, unlike a lot of the mattress companies, Helix manufactures its own. They've got their own team of skilled manufacturers. You ought to see these guys. There's about four of them. And they are, I'll tell you what, they work like nobody's business. They just, they turn these mattresses out. One of them sews and the other one holds the shit because you know they're big, right? This, none mattresses. of this is true. They have no, an entire they, they team. No, 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 it's not true. Manufacturers, and they then they ship them directly from their facility to your door. Yes, that's true. That's to two of them sew and hold, and two no. of them box and ship. You have no idea how they do their staffing, so let's stop pretending you do. Well, I don't know their names, and I'm not sure how much they're paid, but they're really good workers. Their workers it, are really good, but we do not have yes. the number. We do not have the head count. Well, I had their number as soon as they walked through the door. They, Helix has mattresses with cooling technology that help regulate your body temperature if you're sleeping hot, whatever. And you don't have to go to a store and lay down on some of those mattresses. But getting back to Felcher, Felcher and Fanny Featherbottom, Felcher was having that problem. And he went to the doctor and said it must be something to do with your sleep patterns. So what he did was he got a Helix sleep mattress. He went to helixsleep.com and he took the quiz where he told him whether he liked soft, medium, firm, and whether he slept on his side or back or stomach, and, and all of those specifications. He didn't mention about the vomit regurgitation first thing in the morning because they didn't have a box on the site for that. Helix, you might want to fix that soon and, and have no. a question, do you vomit immediately upon awakening? No, it doesn't seem like it's a widespread problem. It seems like it's confined to the Felcher feather bottoms <laughs> you, you or whatever. You think it might be more of a a smaller niche problem now, hopefully, well, see it, it's already been cured. Helix cured Felcher because what he did was when he got that new Helix sleep mattress, he put it right in and he laid right down. And the next day he woke up and he was perfect. He didn't regurgitate the vomit. He was, he was feeling good all day. And Fanny and Fanny likes hers too. As a matter of fact, he got them at the same time and he put his in his bedroom and he put hers out in the hallway and she slept on that. And now every day since he did that, he wakes up in that bed and opens his eyes and he doesn't vomit anymore. And then he calls out to Fanny in the hallway. Wake up, Fanny! In the hallway? Yeah, that's where she's sleeping. And ever since that that's happened, he wakes up and opens his eyes and he doesn't vomit first thing in the morning. It's well, got to be due to the Helix well, sleep listen, mattress. There's no guarantees that Helix will help you with some sort of bizarre medical problem you've never heard of before, 
However, we can guarantee they will be a fine mattress that you will enjoy. And of course, if you don't like it, you can send your money back. We have two mattresses and an all form couch from Helix here in the house here at Last Manor, and we love them. And uh, we'll probably get some more. Check them out today. And remember, they support us. You should support them. Yes. And, and, and see, that's a pun because not only do they support our program and they support our efforts to bring this program to the cult of Cornette, but also they support us literally when we're laying on them. That's right. Very good. Very well yeah, done. So see, you're a punster. Well, thank you. Or as Mama Cornette used to say, you're a poet and don't know it, but your feet show it because they're long fellas. Anyway, so right now, folks, what you need to do to support everybody. Good Lord, it's the burden is on you now, Cult of Cornet listeners. You've got to support everybody in this equation. You got to go to helixsleep.com slash JCE because right now they're offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. 20% off the mattress and a couple of free pillows that you can lay your weary head down or potentially you can take it out in the hall and smother Fanny with it. Go to helixsleep.com slash JCE right now. It's their best offer yet, and it won't last long. So jump on it right now. I don't mean jump on the mattress, jump on the offer. Well, hell, jump on the mattress. Just make sure that it isn't one that somebody's on, like Felix or Fanny. You will have or your own mattress in your own house. You don't have to worry about random people from the cult of Cor or from the factory of Cornet being on your mattress. Well, no, you know, there, there's nobody on these mattresses. But Except somebody's, you. somebody's in your walls <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. Right now, helixsleep.com slash JCE. If it's good enough for the feather bottoms, it's good enough for your bottom. Helix Sleep Mattresses.